live. You get to see me panic. Uh, reset. Awesome. Hey, oh no, my penguin is over my controls. Oh, and okay, well, for now, I guess we'll move the penguin out. Uh, we'll move the controls over a little bit, shall we? Oh, okay, you're not going to let me. Hey, there we go. That's much better. To anyone who's watching, welcome to the pre-stream. You lucky devil, you. Okay, just waiting for some good tweet to go out. And I'm going to double check some bits and pieces. that and I'm gonna click fly should be starting on the runway okay so there's a little bit of lag Someone's joined me in the pre-stream. Naughty. Okay. Let's see. Where are we? What are we doing? I'm going to need to turn off traffic, aren't I? Because I'm not getting very good frames. Let's do traffic. AI offline. We'll do... We'll do like half density and then like quarter density of this. Apply and save. I'll go back. Assume. Okay, hi. I think the tweet should have gone out. No, not yet. Okay, awesome. Check this out. Okay, I think we are just about ready to start. I believe my tweet should have just gone out. Yep. Okay, so welcome. Hi, thanks for joining uh, me on another Friday flight. My name's Adam and I am your original penguin. I'm also the, the captain for this flight. But not for the whole flight. As you'll find out, I have to cheat during this flight and use the AI. Um, but more on that as we get to it. So first of all, I'm going to go ahead and make a start turning on the aircraft systems. So it's been a while since I've done this, so I may end up needing to use the checklist. But we go ahead and turn the batteries on, connect to external power. We are going to turn on the AP bleed. And we're going to turn on the master switch for the APU. Now, click this button. It's all kicking off. Wonderful. Brilliant. We have got power. Well, I can go ahead and turn off the external power. Yep. 
We're going to go and turn on the beacon light. That will let everyone know where we are. Do we need anything? We can go ahead and turn on navigation and logo light. Not that we need it because it's a rather bright and sunny day here in Jacksonville. Uh, Florida, I believe Jacksonville is in. I apologize for my lack of knowledge of American um, geography. I have to profess to being quite ignorant when it comes to American geography. Uh, right, what are we doing now, Adam? Right, yes. Um, okay, so we're going to turn on the fuel pumps. And then, if I'm not mistaken, switch this, and then we're going to turn on an engine. Let's see if this works. If it doesn't, I've done something wrong. Let's hope I haven't done it wrong. Okay, everything seems to be working. I'm going to go ahead and do something that a pilot would never do. I'm actually going to turn the second engine on whilst the first engine is turning on. So we seem to be doing okay with our engines. We'll turn this up actually, because I don't want this to cut out. Awesome source, everything's going well. Alright, engine one is up to, up to speed. Wait for engine two. Okay. Engine 2 is up to speed, so I'm going to go ahead and put this to normal. And then we're going to go ahead and turn off the master APU. Uh, wrong button. Turn off the APU bleed. Okay, there we go. So we are all set. Um, we are all set for getting clearance. So I'm going to tune... First of all, I want to tune ATIS, which is like the weather report. Jacksonville Airport Information Whiskey 1800 Zulu. Okay, so that's what I was waiting for, was the altimeter button. It's actually the bar barometric pressure. So I'm going to turn this up to 3001. And as you might notice down here, this is changing. It's because what it's doing is it's telling me what sea level is, based on the current uh, pressure levels. So there we go. So that should be... Well, it's not zeroed, but it should be zeroed. <laughs> Let's, let's tune to clearance so that we don't have to keep listening to him over and over again. Okay, so the flight plan has already been added to the computer. We can sh I can show you that down here. Flight plan. There go. This is our flight plan. Once we get there, just want to check that I have got the... Um, yes, we've got ILS, thank goodness. Oh, so in case you aren't aware, if you haven't been watching my Twitter account... Um, I had originally planned to fly to Key West, but what I didn't realize was I was landing at a naval air base, and they don't have instrument landing systems um, at naval air bases. Not very often, anyway. Which meant I was trying to land a passenger airliner there, visually. And the problem was is I couldn't actually see the runway, because uh, Key West just happens to be very, very close to, the, uh, to sea level on a large grouping of islands, which meant it was practically impossible to find the runway. So I had to uh, change the destination. Thankfully, this has got an ILS, so I'm pretty confident we'll be able to land anyway. Okay, that was a mouthful. Let's get clearance then. I guess that's all there is left to it. So bring the radio, you know, the communication panel over here. Jacksonville Airport Information Whiskey 18. Oops. Clicked on the wrong one. Request IFR clearance. There we go. Clearance delivery Penguin 1123 IFR to NASA ready to copy. Penguin 
Read that back. Penguin 112 tree cleared to Nassau Airport is filed. Take off runway tree to climb and maintain 12,000 feet. Departure on 127 decimal 0 squawk 6064. Penguin 112 tree read back is correct. Contact ground on 121 decimal 9 when ready to taxi. Okay, so there we go, we've got clearance. And with that, I think it's time I got a nice little screenshot. I'm going to get go ahead and actually get rid of that uh, on-screen display, if I can remember how to do it. Uh, camera, I think. Heads-up display, there we go. Let's turn that off. We don't need that. There we go. We don't need a heads-up display blocking our view, do we? I'm going to take a nice little picture. I'm going to do my live update tweet and then I think we shall get a pushback and make our way to the runway. Uh, no, we haven't got takeoff clearance. Clearance granted. I'd like to take this moment as well to thank you for joining me. Um, if you have joined before, I thanked you earlier. Um, it means a lot, and I hope that I can provide some entertainment during today's stream. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the uh, parking brakes off. That's what they're called, parking brakes. I'm going to tune to the ground, and we're going to request... Taxi. Jacksonville ground penguin 112 tree with whiskey ready to taxi IFR. I bet this taxiway is going to be hard. Penguin 112 tree. Oh, that's not bad. Two and hold short of runway tree two via taxiway Delta Alpha. Contact tower on 118 decimal tree when ready. Taxi two and hold short runway three two via taxiway Delta Alpha. Contact tower 1183 when ready. Penguin 1123. So, I'm going to request a pushback. And you know what? Should we do it in first person view? Should we do this this beginning bit in first person view? I think we should. I just want to see how far back I can go. Okay. An actual pilot would have obviously walked around the outside of their aircraft, so they would already know how far they can go. I'm going to turn my microphone down a little bit. I'm seeing a little bit of peaking I'm not happy with. Um, but obviously I haven't done my walk around so this will have to suffice. So I'm going to do this taxi all in first person. Uh, we're going to request pushback. I'm just going to have to guess when they've pushed me far enough back. My little pushback buggy's just gone beneath me. Starting to move soon. Unless, of course, I haven't actually turned off the parking brake. Yep, it is off. Here we go. And we're away. trust that the air traffic controller will tell me if I have traffic behind me. Oh dear, what happened to that buggy? Oh. Oh dear. Anyway. I can't actually remember which direction I'm supposed to be taxiing. Oh, 
Oh, I see. I see. So let's go. Apparently, I still have the jetway connected. It's just popped up saying request jetway disconnect. Um, so let's go and steer to the left. Is that going to be the right way? Nope, nope, we're going the wrong way. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop, stop. Jacksonville Ground Penguin 112 tree requesting the end of pushback. Penguin 112 tree request to end pushback received. Okay, so I'm going to wait for the pushback vehicle to move out of the way. There he goes. Right, I could correct myself and turn around, but I'm actually going to be a little bit naughty here and I'm just going to taxi over that way. But there is every chance, though, that uh, air traffic control won't like that. Let's just check my parking brake is off. Off. There we go. I'm going to apply a little bit of thrust and we're going to get going. careful because I know there are aircraft around here. So don't forget the rule of thumb is you shouldn't taxi faster than you can walk. That said, I don't want it to take all day to get to the runway, so I'm probably going to go about 20 miles per hour. Oh, I don't know what I've just gone over. There we go. This is quite a bumpy... Uh Bumpy airport. There's every chance that it might crash me uh, because I've got realism settings set to max. I appreciate that. Thank you. It was, uh, I'm assuming you mean my uh, yoke and throttle quadrant. They were actually gifted to me by my partner as a uh, birthday present about a year ago, I think. I haven't been using them as much as I'd like, but now I use them for every Friday flight. It's kind of hard to play this game with mouse and keyboard. It, it's genuinely, in my opinion, nearly impossible. Okay, so there shouldn't, shouldn't be too much traffic today. I've actually had to turn off live traffic. That is because uh, apparently Jacksonville is quite a popular place to fly, and so is Miami. If you've seen my Twitter, you will have noticed there is um, a lot of planes flying around Miami. And they, unfortunately, that causes frame lag because the game has to download the data from servers. So in the effort of avoiding 6 FPS, as you can see down the bottom corner, you can see my FPS, I took the decision to turn off live traffic today. So taxi to and hold short. We're at the hold short. So I'm going to turn off the engine. And we are going to... Look, it still says to request jetway disconnection. I mean, I'm far too far away from the uh, jetway. We're going to go ahead and request uh, takeoff clearance. Jacksonville Tower Penguin 1123 ready for IFR departure runway 32. Penguin 1123 hold, short runway 32. Traffic is Cessna, Skyhawk on base. Okay, hold short runway 32. Hold short runway 32, Penguin 1123. Okay, so on base. Base is this way, I think. I can never remember the traffic pattern for, a, for an airport, so if I show you my VFR map, where I am currently, so you can see this. Penguin 
Clear for takeoff, runway 32, uh, Penguin 1123. Okay, so as you can see here, there is a runway here and a runway here. This uh, Each runway has a left turn traffic pattern. So if I was coming in, and let's say I miss the runway, I would turn left, then I'd turn left again, then I'd turn left, then I'd turn left a final time and I'd come into land. That's the uh, traffic pattern. And each part of the traffic pattern's got a name. Um, I believe you've got downwind and upwind. I believe this is called the base leg, and then this is called final. It's either called final or it's called approach. And that just tells the air traffic controller where you are. Um, because it could be, for example, there are four planes waiting to land, and they are holding the traffic pattern. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. A little bit of information about how airports run. So I've been told that there's traffic on base, which should be somewhere over there, if I'm not mistaken. So let's go ahead and go back into first person. We're going to get ourselves on the runway here and get prepared for takeoff. Dear. It looks like they missed their approach on the... Oh, never mind. There he is. So he decided to show up just afterwards. Well, you nearly saw me get taken out by a Cessna. Let's see if we can show you the Cessna. There he is. Look, going off into the distance. To be honest, I'm going to be honest with you here, right? That made me look really bad. I'm going to tell you why that made me look really bad. Because that aeroplane was coming into land. That means they have priority. For some reason, air traffic control told me I was cleared for takeoff. Which meant I can go on the runway and I will be clear and I can just, you know, I can take my time if I want. It's ready. What they failed to tell me was actually I'm not cleared for run uh, for takeoff. That this aeroplane is on final. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, if they're going to do a job, they may as well at least do it right. So, we're going to go through a couple of systems. So, usually you'd put on your landing lights and, you know, all this jazz. I'm going to turn on... I'm not going to turn on the landing lights because it's a bit too bright. There's no need. I'm going to turn on the no smoking and the seatbelt lights. Clear to land runway three. Well, you're not cleared to land just yet, mate, because I'm still on the runway. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and apply some flaps. And you're really not cleared to land. You're really not. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and apply some power. Oops, forgot to turn off the parking brake. We'll go for about 50% power. Okay, so now we're going to go full throttle. V1. V2. And rotate. I'm going to engage the autopilot. I know that might seem a little bit premature, but it really isn't. This plane is a super smart plane. And I'll put the landing gear away. And I've put the flaps away. Uh, one two decimal zero for uh, penguin one one two three. One two seven decimal zero penguin one one two three. Okay. 
Okay, so we can tune Jacksonville departure. I'm going to contact them. Meanwhile, I'm going to take a little photo just to let people know that we have taken off. Okay, and I'm really sorry, I realised that whilst I'm doing typing, you can't see anything apart from my screenshot. Okay, so let's go back into the cockpit, and what you can see here, this is the flight plan that the computer is following. That is. Do you know, this happened earlier, and I don't know what that is. Let's put on the auto throttle, and I'm going to bring this back down to climb. CT, throttle climb. Okay, there we go. So we've got to climb to 12,000 feet. Fantastic, 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 fantastic. Gorgeous, lovely Jacksonville. Look at this. Right, let's have a look what's going on on the map. Okay, so if you take a look at the map, this is our route that we're going to be flying. We're actually joining an air, uh, an airway. Um, and then this airway requires us to turn around. It's actually quite a strange route that we're flying, but uh, it is what it is. So we're going to be coming up to here. Then we're going to turn them around, basically a 180. I'm going to fly down to, I'm not sure what these islands are. I want to say they're part of Jamaica, but I could be wrong. And then our destination is this little runway down here. I'm not seeing ILS there. That's got me a little bit worried. Oh no, it's okay. It's all right. I've already checked. It is programmed into the MCDU. That is fine. That is fine. Going to 126.75, Penguin 1123. 126.75, Penguin 1123. Uh, Jacksonville Center, Penguin 1123 is flight level 86,000, climbing to flight level 120. Jacksonville Center, Penguin 1123 is at 8,900 feet, climbing 12,000 feet. <laughs> Usually they they say these words, but apparently they don't want to say continue to giggles as planned. <laughs> oh well. Oh, there's St. Mary's beneath us. Looks like something out of um, EastEnders. Well, it looks like the River Thames, I suppose. Beautiful. I'd, I'd like to add, this is a uh, this is live weather as well. So these clouds are supposedly correct and accurate. I don't know what happened just then. It must have been the weather updating. Um, yeah, what a lovely day in Jacksonville. That looks like it could be an army base. Climb and maintain flight level 210, Penguin 1123. Climb and maintain flight level 210, Penguin 1123. 
Okay, so the weather definitely updated then because it just added a lot of cloud. It also gave me a massive lag spike. But it is what it is. I know, it's such a shame that I cannot show you this um, with the Mac settings, the Mac settings that my computer will support, but unfortunately, um, OBS takes up too much resources and I need to bring the quality settings down, the performance. I need to decrease, decrease the graphic settings. There we go. That's the correct phrase. I can't remember what these buttons do, so I'll... Oh, that's trim. Yes, I've adjusted trim. Never mind. Tell you what we could do. Seeing as we're about to fly over just pure water, maybe, maybe we can go ahead and add some live traffic back in. So I'm going to pull this map over, and you should, you should start to see some live traffic. It will show me traffic that's closest to me. Yep, there we go. There's our first bit of traffic. Let's see if we can spot... Oh, look, there's another one in front of us. Let's see if we can spot the one that's behind us. There he is. Okay. I'm going to pull this map off to the side again now. Uh, what I am going to do though is I'm going to go ahead and turn down the air traffic controller only because two reasons actually two reasons the first one is um, the first one is now that I've turned live traffic back on they're not going to shut up I'm not going to be able to get a word in edgeways trust me when I flew my test flight I could not speak without them nattering away and the other thing is because I'm hoping that the co-pilot will handle the communications, which means I don't really need to listen to them. Tower on one tree, two decimal, one Cessna six, seven six. Ooh, it's looking a bit cloudy now. We are at 17,000 feet. Okay. So, I think it's about time I... Oops. I'm going to turn the AI control on. I'm going to let the AI manage radio comms. And in a minute, I'm going to turn on control the aircraft. I'm going to be honest with you here. I have never done this before. Genuinely never done this before because I've never seen the need. Um, and I am a little bit worried about what it might do. It might put me completely off track and do something wild and wacky. If that happens, uh, well, I guess I'm going to have to improvise. But this is just so that I'm able to give the presentation um, whilst I'm supposed to be controlling the aircraft. So I'm going to close that for now. And I am going to do a five minute warning for Twitter just to let them know that the presentation will be starting soon. This is a five minute warning. Like, watch in flight presentation. Shorter job. Okay, so I'm going to hit tweet and I'm going to start my trusty stopwatch. I think it's probably about time I turn off the uh, camera. You guys get a nice, clear, uninterrupted view of uh, 
beautiful. I'm not actually quite sure where we are. I apologize. I don't know American. Uh, I don't know American geography very well. But if anyone does know where we are, then drop it in chat and I'll, I'll announce it. If you're interested, that airport there, its international code is KBQK. Maybe that will help. So, I have a feeling we might be flying in clouds today. Oh dear, I think these are thunder clouds. Oh man. I wonder, let's go down here and we'll put the radar on. Let's see if we if I can remember how to actually get the radar to work. So we go to weather. Yeah, weather. Radar system. Um, ah, there we go. Right, so now we've got it. There we go. So that means that that little bit of green there means weather. And what you want to watch out for is pink. Pink means really bad weather. Oh, I haven't got the flight director on. There we go. That tells you what the plane is doing and what you need to do to, to do it. So we've got 2 minutes and 15 seconds until I start the presentation. So be sure to... Oh, look at that. Did you see that bit of thunder? That bit of lightning even. You don't see thunder, Adam. I wonder if we can get another one. Oh, there we go. Another one. <laughs> I don't know what this guy's doing, but he's probably going to regret flying that low to the clouds. We got another one. But it seems like it's a little bit stormy in Jacksonville. I'm going to quickly show you whilst we're here. I'm going to show you the uh, this navigation map. Oh wow! Look, there we go. There's the weather. <laughs> oh my goodness! I should have checked before we left. Look at that. That is what you call bad weather. There is no other way of describing that. That is bad weather. Oh my goodness, 60 knot winds. Look at that. Or 56 even. My goodness. I wouldn't be surprised if this plane is flying a little bit funny. Wow, that's terrible. 60 knot winds, and they're coming from behind us at the minute, so we're actually losing lift. they're going to ask us to climb one last time we've just hit the five minute mark i'm going to go ahead and click to turn on the excuse me the autopilot well, well not the autopilot he's just turned the autopilot off but he is going to now fly the plane instead of autopilot let's hope this goes well uh for some reason he wants to turn right around Quebec 
I don't know what he's doing with the throttle. He's over speeding a little bit here. He has decided to ignore. Uh, but let me put it this way. That shouldn't be red. Come on, don't be annoyed. Okay. I'm just going to assume that things will go well from here, and I'm going to turn down the game sound. And we're going to make a start on the presentation, so I can reset that timer. Let's go. It goes out over there. Then I need this. Okay. If you guys would be so kind, can you just let me know if you can hear clearly, hear me clearly, over the sound of the game audio? Is, uh, is everything coming through loud and clear or, or not? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make a start then. So, uh, where has my script gone? Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to all. My name is Adam, and thank you for joining me for the second original Penguin presentation. Play the video. Play the video, there we go. In this presentation, I'll be going over various aspects of aviation during World War I. As always, if you're watching live, please drop your questions and comments in the chat, and I'll get to them at the end. For those who are watching this after the broadcast, feel free to drop a comment or pop up in my Twitter feed. You can find me at Original Penguin. This presentation will look specifically into the areas shown on the screen. Those are early uses, how planes, which had only had their first successful flight a little over 10 years prior, were used during the initial stages of World War I. Over speed. Over speed. Bear with me. I do not know what this pilot is doing. Has he put my... I am so sorry. I had a feeling this might happen. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put that back on climb. Cruise. I think we're done. I think we're done. I'm just going to have to leave autopilot on, I'm afraid, because managed altitude, managed, everything is managed, sorted, brilliant. Okay, right, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Apologies for that. I knew something would go wrong, and of course, it's the, it's the game's own AI. Okay, so, um, manufacturing, how the airplanes were crafted, aircraft design, some of the key design changes that happened during the First World War, training and aces, a quick overview of the process of learning to be a pilot during World War I, also covering some of the more famous pilots, and aerial combat, how air-to-air -air combat changed, and how the Sopwith Camel and Fokker planes changed things dramatically. I'd like to take a moment to caution you all. During this presentation are many clips that could either be propaganda or genuine footage. Unfortunately, the places I sourced these clips didn't provide any insight either way. This clip, for example, was almost certainly used for propaganda. And so we begin, with the first flight being in 1901, 
If you've seen my previous presentation, you'll know who took that first flight. It wasn't the Wright brothers. People were still getting to grips with the uses of aircraft. The earliest uses were for reconnaissance, finding key targets, mapping trenches and ascertaining the enemy's strongest and weakest areas. It didn't take long before someone realised you could drop explosives from a plane, bringing about strategic bombing. The image shown on the left is a co-pilot operating a mounted camera, but as you'll see in the next clip, those cameras could be operated and carried by hand. The image on the right is a pilot about to throw a bomb from a cockpit. This was very common during the early stages of war, before they were affixed to the plane themselves. This clip shows real aerial footage captured by a World War I aircraft, and whilst I have my reservations about the cut to pilots and whether they are actually airborne, the important thing to note here is the camera being operated by the co-pilot. If you search for images of World War I cameras, you'll see that they range from the relatively small camcorder style, um, the relatively small camcorder styles, to what can only be described as a cannon-shaped camera fixed to the machine gun mounts. While doing reconnaissance, the pilots would often drop bags which contained handwritten notes and sketches, as the glass plates used for photography wouldn't survive being dropped. Airborne reconnaissance had a bigger impact on the First World War than airborne combat, but it is often overlooked. In this clip you'll see how bombs eventually were attached to the plane. Different planes approached this in different ways, but in the clip you're watching, uh, yet to be shown, the bombs were mounted under the wing and held in place, rather insecurely, by a clip. And the pilot or co-pilot would pull a lever which in turn would pull a cord, releasing the bomb and allowing it to break free from that clip. As you can see him there, the clip is at the front whereas it is slotted in at the back and released with the cable. Strategic bombing, which has a different meaning in today's warfare, was mainly about lowering the enemy's morale by attacking civilians, factories and railway lines. This isn't to prevent armaments or troop movements, but rather to disrupt food supply lines and other necessities. Most of the strategic bombing was carried out by British and the French during World War I, but the attacking of cities was introduced specifically by Germany using blimps and zeppelins, as they were able to carry a heavier payload. Eventually, as the hydrogen-filled balloon is really just a floating bomb, planes became the favoured craft for dropping incendiaries. Moving on to section 2, manufacture. Different countries had different techniques for producing their aircraft, but in Britain the tasks were divided between men and women. The largest aircraft factory in England was located in Wadden, which is Croydon, and it comprised of 58 buildings. The final assembly hall was 218 by 45 metres. Unlike World War II aircraft, which were made primarily of aluminium, or for my American friends, aluminium, uh, planes in World War I... <laughs> I'm sorry for the accent, I'm sorry. Planes in World War I were made of wooden frame with a stitched canvas glued over it. Women were typically given the task of creating and affixing the aircraft skin, whilst men, mostly men dodging the draft, would produce the frames, engines, propellers, etc. In this clip you'll see how propellers were glued, shaped and their scale. As I explained, these jobs were usually given to men, and something to note Quite often the planes were delivered disassembled and pilots would have to assemble the planes themselves, something which would absolutely not happen today. If a wing didn't align properly with the fastening holes, pilots would often jerry-rig it using various tools. It wasn't uncommon for a wing to fall off mid-flight during World War I. And I'm going to take a moment to allow you to watch this clip, it's quite a, uh, a lengthy clip, it's a couple of minutes. Decimal zero penguin one. 
as you can see there, he's sanding down what you saw before was several layers of wood. That's not how propellers are made nowadays. And you can now see, you will now see the finished propeller. Which are rather large. That there is probably a propeller for a bomber or potentially a pusher aircraft. Um, which you will get to see very soon. Um, and now showing you the wings. This clip's a little bit hard to see. But uh, you'll see the airframe, and and then I think we shall move on. So that is the frame of the wing, where a cloth would then be stretched over it, and dope was applied um, to hold it in place. So this this clip's a little bit unclear, so I'll show you a little bit of it, but then we'll move on. Okay. So moving on to section three, the various engineering challenges and design changes that occurred during World War One. I'll be covering some of the biggest changes here. As aviation was still in its infancy, many small adaptations and improvements were made, far too many to cover in a presentation like this. But the main three I'll be covering are currently shown on the screen, being the changes in engines, the pusher aircraft, and machine gun synchronization. In this clip, you'll see how squadrons were made up of many plane designs, though most planes stuck to the, to the traditional bi- or triplane, their shape, size and positions varied wildly. So this is one flying squadron, and as you can see, Quite a lot of the planes are completely different from others. You've got small planes, tall planes, wide planes, narrower planes, planes with equal wing length, planes with wildly massive, uh, wildly different plane uh, wing span. Uh, you've got a monoplane there, that means one pair of wings. Okay, so now. move on to the next one okay so now we're getting on to the engines on the left is a radial and on the right is a rotary obviously these are just diagrams showing how they operate but you'll get to see both in action during various clips later on in the presentation I'm not going to spend too long on explaining how they work as the images are a little bit unpleasant to spend uh, the images are a little bit unpleasant on the eyes um, or maybe it's just me I've been looking at them all day the quick version is that the radial engine, the one on the left, has a rotating crankshaft which powers the cylinder's strokes. Whereas the rotary engine has a fixed crankshaft and the rotating cylinders enable the various strokes. And I will now drop a Vimeo link into the chat that you should bookmark. No, don't go look at it now. <laughs> And if you head over to this Vimeo link, once the presentation, uh, once the flight is over, you can see a display in Paris's Air and Space Museum, which shows the difference between a rotary and a radial engine. The image copyright here is to Michael Frey, it is his own work, and this is made available under Creative Commons. This is a picture of the Vickers Vampire Pusher biplane. As you can see, the propeller is behind the engine and pilot. This allowed the aircraft to have fixed mounted machine guns in the nose. Unfortunately, pusher planes suffered from poor handling and would frequently struggle to recover from spins and stalls. Only four Vickers Vampires were made, but by the time the third had left the factory, the British Royal Flying Corps had already opted for the more effective Sopwith TF2 Salamander. In this clip, you'll get to see a rotary and radial engine as well as a pusher aircraft. I'll explain as they appear. So here is a pilot testing out the instrument panel and also testing out the control surfaces. So the elevators, rudders and ailerons. 
this was typical of pre-flight checks, and in fact it still happens today in a lot of aircraft. Next, we're going to see a um, uh, an eight-cylinder engine. Uh, I can't remember whether this one is uh, rotary or radial. Let's see. Okay, so this is a rotary. This is a rotary engine. So within, you may have seen. Uh, I'm not going to be able to rewind that, am I? Okay, so. These here are the exhausts, and the cylinders would be behind that. So now you're going to see a radial engine. Where the actual cylinders rotate with the propeller. Moving on. Something that deserves special mention, which some may have seen pop up on my Twitter recently, is Germany's attempt at making an invisible aeroplane. The image here is a Fokker 2. I'm gonna this they're never gonna monetize me me saying that. A Fokker 2 with the canvas swapped out for Selen Acetate, a product similar to movie film. Whilst the engine frame and pilot was still visible, Flying at 900 feet or higher made them incredibly difficult to see. Without radar, planes were practically invisible at night, so this was an attempt to bring that advantage to the daytime. The problem was that Celon was highly reflective in direct sunlight, and that meant oftentimes the plane acted as a beacon, signalling to anyone who was paying even minor attention to their surroundings. Uh, this image was sourced from We Are The Mighty, so they, the credit goes to them this image and heading over to machine gun synchronization this complex engineering achievement allowed for more efficient tractor aircraft those that had the propeller in front of the engine to have forward mounted machine guns this made a big deal in aerial combat which was previously next to non-existent there are plenty of stories of pilots throwing objects pulling faces or simply waving at each other as they passed it's quite a lovely story. Initial flight training I'm going to let you listen to this clip for a moment before continuing with my narration. His job was to teach the student the do's and don'ts of flying, such as how a plane got into a tailspin, and how to recover safely before crashing. The big moment came when it was time to go up alone, the first solo flight. After a few words of both caution and encouragement from the instructor, the cadet took off alone for a short flight around the airfield. Then came the most hazardous part, the first solo landing. A three-point landing on the first solo flight was more luck than skill. The student continued to fly both with and without an instructor, gaining experience and confidence. Much time was devoted to flying single-seat planes in preparation for combat duty at the front. Finally, graduation day arrived. They'd earned their wings. While pilots were needed to fly the planes, Many men were needed to maintain both engines and planes. Their responsibility would be to keep the airplanes in top flying and fighting condition. Pilots had the highest respect for their ground crews, knowing that their chance for survival was increased by their efforts. Okay, so as the war claimed more and more lives, by the way, I've just got to say, I uh, absolutely wonderful clip there from war history online i only showed you about a minute 40 seconds of that clip uh the actual clip is about 11 minutes long please go check out that youtube channel where you can see the whole thing 
As the war claimed more and more lives, those in command became desperate to get pilots through the door as quickly as possible. Some men received only a few hours of training before being sent on active missions. The average lifespan of a pilot during World War I was just three weeks, though it should be noted this is towards the end of the war. As we've seen already, early airplanes were mainly used for observation and not combat. Moving on to aerial aces, this is section four. I have to try and say this. Manf Manfred von Richthofen was known by several names. To the British, it was the Red Knight. To the French, Diable Rouge, which means Red Devil. But he is best remembered for the moniker Red Baron. As his reputation grew... Oh, uh, my tongue tied. As his reputation grew, Richthofen painted his plane, a Fokker triplane, in red, which earned him his nickname. Similarly, his squadron became known as the Flying Circus, owing to their mobility and recognisable colours. He was killed in 1918, with his body being recovered by Allied forces. He was buried with full military honours, and as a final salute, the Baron's former enemies laid a wreath on his casket with an inscription that said, Our gallant and worthy foe. Albert Ball, pictured on the left, was the British Empire's most beloved pilot. He was famous for his quiet demeanour, reportedly being a fan of gardening and living in a small shack next to his aeroplane hangar. His favourite way of tackling enemy fighters was to get under them, tilt the machine gun and fire on them from below. He was killed at the age of 20 when battling with the Flying Circus. It is believed his depression was a part in this demise. And finally, we move on to Eddie Rickenbacker, an, aero, an American race car driver and lifelong daredevil. He was two years above the age limit for pilots, but he provided a natural in the cockpit, earning the Medal of Honor for single-handedly engaging seven German aircraft and killing two before managing to get away. After the war in 1941 and 1942, he suffered a pair of terrible plane crashes, the second of which left him adrift in the Pacific for 22 days. In the next clip, you'll get to see the Ace of Aces in action for a propaganda video. The invention of the machine gun synchronization gear allowed for more deadly air aerial combat. But firstly though, please enjoy this clip. Okay, so one of the first aerial battles is called the First Battle of the Somme, which occurred in 1916. The Royal Flyers were still using planes that are an easy target for the new Fokkers and as a result lost the um, air superiority. By the end of 1917 air superiority swung back towards the Allies owing to a number of structural problems within the Fokker DR-1. That and the dual machine gun Sopwith Camel becoming available in vast numbers. And that brings us on to the final part of this the most famous planes of World War I, the Sopwith Camel and the Fokker Eindecker. The Sopwith Camel was a British single-seat biplane fighter developed by the Sopwith Aviation Company. Reportedly difficult to handle, it was highly maneuverable when flown by an experienced pilot. Towards the end of the war, they were also used for ground attack aircraft. The Camel was developed out of necessity as the Sopwith Pup was no match for the Albatross D3. The Fokker Eindecker were a series of aircrafts with multiple variations. Monoplane, single-seater and designed by a Dutch engineer, Anthony Fokker. For the first year of their deployment, the Eindecker gave Germany a degree of air superiority. Together, these aeroplanes became the most famous aircrafts of World War I. Here is a short clip showing a German observation plane being shot down but the pilot surviving. I also think I've just been told to descend, so we'll have to see. Thankfully we have reached the end of the presentation anyway, so I should be able to return to the flight no harm.
And so I'd like to... Oh, is it done? There we go. So I'd like to thank you for watching this Penguin original presentation. This is number two in the series. Number one can be found on my YouTube channel. And the first one covered aviation throughout history. Um, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Please make sure to like if you enjoyed it. And if you didn't enjoy it, I, I encourage you to dislike. It tells me that I need to improve. Um, I do the best that I can with the tools that are available with, to me. But uh, all feedback is welcome. Um, I've also been told that I'm supposed to remind people to subscribe. Hey, if you subscribe, that's brilliant. But at the end of the day, I only want you to subscribe if you're interested in my content. So thank you either way. So let's go ahead and take a little screenshot of this. We'll let people know that the um, let people know that the presentation has ended. Okay. So I can go ahead and close that. I can go ahead and close that. Go back to here. Right, let's see. What have I been told to do and not done? Nothing. Okay, so we're doing well. All right, so I can turn off manage radio comms. I'll handle that myself. We'll see where we are in our flight. In the middle of nowhere. Brilliant. Just where I should be. If I was anywhere else, I'd be worried. We are approximately 20 minutes out, I would say. I, I will check. I do have tools to tell me exactly how far out we are. But just as a rough idea, we're about 20 minutes out. Oh my, we have got some massive tailwinds. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So I think we are actually going to have to reduce our cruise speed because right now... That's okay. Hey, um, as, as long as I have taught you just a little bit today you know um i'm happy as long as you've learned something new and you find it interested yeah I'm happy. okay so cruise we want oh no i want climb don't i next phase Oh, you're not going to let me change the speed, are you? Because I can't click on that. Okay. Well, right now we're a little bit fast. Oh, I know what I can do. I can manage the speed myself. <laughs> go ahead and bring this down to three. We'll go back. We'll bring this down to 320 knots. Why are you not paying attention to... Have I just gone full reverse? <laughs> that would be hilarious if I went in reverse. We've still got a little bit of weather down here. Hey, there we go. <laughs> I 
One three four decimal two penguin one one two three. One three four decimal two penguin one one two three. Okay, so we got there we go, that's why that's not working. One one three four. One three four decimal two. So I'm gonna show you how they would how one would use the radio stack. One three four decimal two So this will be the standby frequency and I'm using the first radio stack so this airplane has three different uh, excuse me communication uh, uh, antenna but I'm just gonna stick to the first one one three four decimal two I'm gonna look there we go and then we contact Miami Center Lost the frame rate for a second then. I have a feeling that right now the game has decided to download terrain data. Okay, so let's change the range. Now, as you can see, we are about 160 nautical miles away from our destination. I'm going to go ahead and bring that down to 40. We've got a bit of weather off to the left here. Um, I also going to change no not that one this one down in here okay Let's see if we can spot that weather oh there we go that was easy Apparently we have a friend off to just around here. Let's see if we can spot them. They might be quite low down. No, can't see them. Never mind. Oh yes, I was going to tell you how long we've got left in the flight. Let's have a look, shall we? Right, so we go flight plan. Estimated arrival time is 1938. Does this plane have a clock in it? It should do. 1910. Okay, so we have got roughly 28 minutes until we come into land. So if you need to have a drink or anything... Oh dear, there's a plane that's coming rather fast. Oh look, there he is. I found another friend. So yeah, uh, as we've got about 28 minutes, feel free to go grab a drink, get something to eat, uh, watch someone else's stream if uh, if you haven't got someone else's stream already open. Yeah, you know, I, I have nothing else to tell you right now because I don't know America, I'm afraid. And there's no scenery to talk about. Saying that, we are approaching some scenery. Ah, so we are approaching Jamaica. We're approaching Jama Jamarex, which I can only take to mean Jamaica. This must be Jamaican airspace. This red line, oh, uh, red. This orange line must be Jamaican airspace.
<laughs> oh, you heard me singing it, did you? <laughs> That's only a little bit embarrassing. Don't you? That's now immortalised on my stream. Me quietly mumbling, jamming. Is it Stevie Wonder? Yeah, no, I think it is. Yeah, I think you're right. Wow, this is gorgeous. Look at that lovely blue ocean. I just realized I'm supposed to be seeing loads of ships. I've installed a mod that, in that adds loads of ships. But I'm not actually seeing any. It definitely is. A lot of Stevie Wonder songs are uh, I feel good. <laughs> I just noticed my viewers went up when I started singing. Oh dear. I'm going to go ahead and actually post this picture of Jamaica because it's looking mighty fine. I'm going to feel really bad though if I've got my geography wrong and it turns out it's not Jamaica. It's like, I don't know, Idaho. Let's see, we should be starting our descent soon. Uh, saying that, we're about 22 minutes out. What's the weather doing now? Oh my goodness, we're still 30 knots. That's the strongest wind I've landed in. The last um, trip that I did, last week's Friday flight, no, not last week's, the week before. Yeah, yeah, the week before. Oh, so the first presentation one. Oh. So every time I do a presentation, it's going to give me horrible crosswinds, is it? I might need to stop doing the presentations then. <laughs> anyway. This is the highest crossed winds that I will have landed in, as long as it stays at this speed. So landing will be in approximately, let me just check what that time is and what my time is. Oh, so it's about, this, it's about the same, about a minute behind. Okay, so we should be landing in about 21 minutes according to the in-flight computer. Hi Nathan, glad you could join. Yeah, we should be landing in about 20... 20, 21 minutes, providing everything goes well. Oh, I won't crash today. Don't worry about that. As long as no one crashes into me, because the airways are quite busy, um, 
As long as no one crashes into me, there's no reason for me to crash. <laughs> I'm not really flying. <laughs> That's why there's no reason I should crash. I just realised I haven't turned the uh, volume back up. Let's go ahead and turn that back up, shall we? Radio 120 DME arc, clear to Zulu Foxtrot, Papa Western Bahama 12 mess around. There's no harm in messing around. It would just mean that's... I don't even know if you can grief on this. I don't know if that's possible. I'm pretty sure you can hit um, AI traffic, but I don't think you can hit other player traffic. And I have a feeling my barometer is set wrong. Oh. There we go. Descend and maintain flight level 210, Penguin 1123. Descend and maintain flight level 210, Penguin 1123. Okay, so we better let people know that we're starting our descent. Good evening, Eddie. Thank you for joining. Okay, let's go ahead and tweak that out. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do a barrel roll in the uh, Airbus, I'm afraid, Nathan. It would be interesting, that's to say the least. Okay, so we are on the very close to our uh, our destination. Lots of uh, lots of other players around here. Send and maintain 9,000 feet, Penguin 1123. Level 
This is because there's loads of other players. I can't, I can't tell the ATC that I've heard the instructions. There we go. I am going to put the plane back into auto throttle mode. Um, so let's just double check. There we go. Awesome. Right. How many years playing flight sim to get to this level? Um, do you know, it, it, it's more... I haven't got my camera on, that's why. So I would say it's more... I'm going to come back to your question, Nathan, in a second. It's more about um, having a bit of real-life experience is really helpful. Um, but also watching some tutorials online from real pilots. Um, so I've flown a plane before. I've flown a couple of times, but I've also watched a lot of tutorials. One two five decimal seven for Penguin one one two three. Um, so I kind of had an understanding of how to fly a plane anyway. Obviously not an airliner. I've never touched an airliner in real life. No, never been behind the controls of one before. But um, it's similar. It's similar to flying a proper plane, uh, from what I'm told. And Nathan, to answer your question, no. So in phonetics, which is how, which is the language you use over a radio, three is pronounced as tree. Five is pronounced as fife, and nine is pronounced as niner. It's so that they come through the radio clearer. Because the th sound doesn't go through radios very well, and it can come through as an s or just a hiss. Oh, wow, look at that. Look at that. That is so gorgeous. You, you can see... You can see Microsoft downloading the terrain data as I've not flown here before. We are currently flying over Jamaica. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we're flying over Jamaica. I could be completely wrong. I could be completely wrong. My uh, my knowledge of American geography is pretty bad. But I believe we're flying over Jamaica. So this is Miami, if I'm not mistaken. And this is just off the coast of Miami. I want a picture of that. There we go. We'll tweet that later. Uh, I should lower my altitude and take a closer look. <laughs> well, we already are going to be lowering our altitude, and I imagine, I imagine, Jamaica is beautiful all the way down to the airport. It's not going to suddenly look like a brummy car park. It might be. The only thing that makes me think it is Jamaica is because of the airspace being called Jammer X, which would make sense for it to be Jamaica, but like I said, I could be wrong. Rummy little car park is the worst. Send and maintain 2,000 feet. Uh, 
Expect ILS runway 14 approach by a major. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click the ILS button. And we've already got our approach programmed in. So right now we're coming in quite low. Once we hit... Um, once we hit about 6,000 feet, I think I'm going to lower my landing gear. Just in case we need to take an emergency landing. <laughs> Um, so I'm afraid you're going to have to wait until we've landed to discuss the carry-on. Um, there's a very good chance that it was left back in Jacksonville. And I'm also, whilst we're here, going to change this over to ILS mode. Oh, look at that. The, uh, the winds have decreased. So initially this second number here said... 30. At one point at the beginning of the stream, I was flying through a storm. Apparently there's a storm in Jacksonville at the minute, a lightning storm, and I was getting 60 knot winds. Um, so right now we're going to be landing in six, which is a much nicer number than we had before. Did I not tell it to go down? Cool, 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 cool. We have just hit 6,000 feet, so I'm going to go ahead and lower my landing gear. And the plane is automatically going to slow itself down. I'm pretty sure that's our runway over there. Oh no, maybe not. No, apparently our runway is actually quite far off. Um, well, this was only a short flight. Uh, you're going to have to take that up with the airline company. I just fly the plane. Go down here. We're going to zoom this right in. Um, so, learning these buttons and switches, it's fine because I've set these buttons and switches. As for the buttons and switches on this plane, I actually played a lot of Flight Sim X as a kid. I absolutely love Flight Sim X. It's a fantastic game. And so I already had a, a basic understanding of a lot of like how the autopilot screens worked, um, a lot of these instrument panels, so with the lights, um, and, um, I would say that was about it. So the instrument panels. Oh, I also knew how to use the radio stack. Not that I ever do because it's a bit, I find it's a bit long being immersive in that way. I'd much rather have, I'd much rather have a uh, physical radio stack that I could use, but they're expensive. Anyway, um, so I actually watched a tutorial video on how to use some of the more uh, complicated systems. Like for example, this MCDU down here. Um, this actually contains all the data that's programmed to... This is what's flying the plane, not the autopilot. The autopilot, if you look, you'll see... Ooh, camera. You'll see those two dots. That means that that is managed by this computer. The altitude is being managed by me. But if I was to go ahead and hit uh, managed mode, it would do that for me too. What I am going to do is... Oh no, we're not in the ILS yet. Okay. Oh, okay. We have, we've been captured by the ILS apparently. Um, 
But yeah, so I watched a couple of tutorial videos on how to use specifically this Airbus. Um, if I was to go in the Boeing 747, I'd have a rough idea of how to use the uh, uh, various knobs and switches in there, but it's a much older plane. Um, for example, this plane can fly itself from start to finish, pretty much. Uh, one two one decimal zero for penguin one one two three. One two one decimal zero for penguin one one two three. Uh, NASA approach penguin one one two three with you at flight level two zero uh, inbound. NASA approach penguin one one two three two thousand feet. Penguin one one two three NASA approach. Okay. So we are actually really close to our destination. Apparently, though I'm not seeing any land. Oh, so that little that little bit just in the distance over there. That's where we're landing, and apparently the runway is quite close to the edge of the landscape. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stadia Dad. I certainly like to think of my content as a little bit different from, from the norm. So, you know, people certainly don't come here expecting to see... Uh, oh dear, look, we've got some traffic ahead of us. They don't expect to see me, I don't know, fighting... Uh, like combat training or anything like that. Though you never know, I may buy myself a Eurofighter. They have got one in the store. Okay, so... I'm not quite sure when to hit approach because oh oh so this aircraft ahead of us might actually be landing at the same runway as us we might have to uh we might have to go into a traffic holding pattern because if you look at this vfr map you can see he is seems to be following the same route well Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Contact NASA Tower on one tree, four decimal five, five point inbound. Okay. Uh, going to one three four decimal five five penguin one one two three. Tower on one tree, four decimal five five penguin one one two three. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly explain uh, what's going on here. Knowledge. Okay, so right here, this is telling me if I'm in line with the runway. That's the same as this pink line here. I'm not perfectly in line, but I'm very much getting there. And then there's this pink diamond here. That will tell me if I'm on the right glide slope. At the moment, apparently, I am too uh, low or high. I can't remember. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click this approach button. And what that's going to do is now the ILS system, the instrument landing system, is going to direct the plane and tell it what to do. So no longer, ooh, it's no longer this flight computer telling it what to do. It's now a system within the airport that is sending instructions to the airplane. Um, I'm also going to apply some flaps just to bring our speed down a little bit. Saying that, the plane decided that it was time to add a ton of throttle. There we go. Okay, so you can see this diamond starting to decrease as we get closer. We should see the runway. Oh, look, there's our friend coming into land. Hotel Alpha cleared to land runway 14. 
we, we're probably going to get told to uh, turn around. That is another player, and I don't think we've got enough space between us. But if the air traffic controller isn't going to tell me to slow down, then or to enter traffic holding pattern, then it is what it is. Okay, so as you just saw, the plane nose down. That's because it's been captured by the... Um, oh, okay, there we go. Clear to land runway 14, Penguin 1123, wind 208 at 2-0. Okay, so we have got quite a bit of wind. But they've told us just to follow on behind. So the ILS system is now capturing, has captured us. We're now on the glide slope, in line. We're at the right speed. Everything is looking perfect. We're flying into quite, quite a fast headwind, which isn't a problem. Um, it would be a problem if it was a crosswind, but thankfully it isn't. So I'm going to go, should we do first person or, or third person? You've got to answer quickly though, because it, it, it won't take long before we're there and I'll have to make the decision for you. Am I landing in first person or third person? First person, all right, okay. Okay, so here we go. So we are 600 feet from the ground. <laughs> um, I, it's a bit too late to make the change now, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to... We're going to disconnect the autopilot. Okay. Go around, Penguin 1123. Ah, that's what's going on. Okay, so what happened there was I was told to go around. So we're going to bring that back down. No, not a real person. It's computer generated. What do you mean? Continuous planned. I don't know where Hinsey is, I'm afraid. Okay, you're going to have to tell me which way to go, I'm afraid. Penguin, requesting vector to next waypoint. Okay, so we're going to turn and follow heading 300. I'm going to turn the autopilot back on. Uh, engage selected altitude. We're going to turn off the following heading 300. Yes, yes, I heard you. Continue to hit the turning in following heading 300 Penguin 1123. Over speed, over speed, over speed, over speed, over speed, over speed, over speed. Okay, I'm going to put the landing gear away because we're going a little bit too fast for this. That person was such a pain in the bum. All right, 300. Two hundred knots. United two four zero one, please expedite your climb to five thousand four hundred feet. Okay, I'm gonna put this into climb mode. United two four zero one, climb and maintain two thousand feet. 
That's the first time I've ever been told to go around, by the way. So this will be interesting. I don't think you wish you were on this plane. Not not after the way that I just did this this turning and my go around. <laughs> Usually I would have programmed in a go around and I would have just hit a button and the plane would go. But I genuinely was not expecting to need to go around, so I didn't. So I did it manually. It would have been rather uncomfortable. You would have spilt your drink absolutely 100%. I can promise you would have spilt your drink. I'm quite surprised about this traffic pattern because I've been told to turn right. Usually you'd be told to turn left. I must be entering a holding pattern. So I'm continuing on to Hinsey. Where is Hinsey? I don't actually know where Hinsey is. Heading three three zero, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Continue to hit the turning in following heading three three zero penguin one one two three. This way. Oh no, there he is. Yeah, I see him. Traffic in sight. Oh look, there's another one. That is a fair enough comment, actually. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's dangerous. That was a little bit dangerous. Him flying across an airway like that. The bloody lunatic. That's what he is. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I think we should go to... I wonder where this turns if I tell it to engage manage heading mode. We're going to keep it on like that for now. Where do you want me to go? NASA approach Penguin 1123 requesting vector to next waypoint. Penguin 1123, turn left, heading 250. Hey, I'm not going all the way back there.
Okay, we're going to do managed heading mode because I've got a feeling it's sending me too far back. So we are going IL. There we go. Oh. I'm going to turn around. I'm honestly curious where it wanted me to go because I'm not seeing a... Ah, oh, there's Hinsey. That's what it wanted me to do. It wanted me to fly to Hinsey. Then I would have been told to fly there. Then to Muni. Ah. No wonder I couldn't find it. I'm going to go ahead and tune back into the tower. Contact the tower. Apologies, everyone, by the way, you know... This really wasn't expected. I wasn't expecting to be told to go around. We're going to do managed airspeed. I'm going to go ahead and click approach again. Managed altitude. Right. Acknowledge. So I'm going to bring down some flaps so we reduce our airspeed. Then I'm going to go ahead and pull down the landing gear. That's our landing gear going down. Don't worry, we're going to do this in first person. And this time we will land. Um, I promise you we will land. Okay, here we go. Here we go. If it tells me to go around this time, I'm just going to not um, and hope for the best. Hope that I don't crash into another plane because otherwise it's just going to extend and extend and extend and extend. I'd like to have dinner at some point. Okay, so we've just been captured by the ILS, which means we are on final. Clear to land runway 14. Penguin 1123. Clear to land runway 14 Penguin 1123. Okay, here we go. Here we go. We're going to touch down this time, I promise. Perfect headwind. Honestly, I could not ask for a better headwind, which means that we're going to be able to stop shorter than we would usually. So we're now 1,000 feet above sea level. I think once we get to about uh, maybe 200 feet above ground, or not above ground, sorry. Yeah, above ground. Oh, I haven't set my MDH. Never mind. I'm going to have to eyeball it. Um, I'll take control. Runway, what's going on? Oh, the, we got a crosswind. Okay, that's what's going on.
That's what's going on, is it? Okay. Apologies, that was a terrible landing, but we managed. Okay, so contact ground on 112 decimal 7. 121 decimal 7, sorry. 121 I wouldn't really call it a very good landing, though, Gem. So. <laughs> Yeah, my call sign is Penguin1123, so contact ground, I'm going to ask the taxi to, we'll ask the taxi to the gates. Oh. Ground penguin one, one, two, three. True, true, but for some reason my ILS um, didn't leave me in line with the runway. We're going to taxi via taxiway alpha, which is... Yep, of course, it's just off to the side of me, so let's go. Oh, I forgot to acknowledge. Uh, taxi to gate 1 using taxiway alpha, penguin 1123. Taxiing to gate 1 via taxiway alpha, penguin 1123. Add a little bit of thrust just to get us going. There we go. So all that's left is to get to the gates. I mean, I can call. Um, I can call for a ramp to come let the passengers out. Not that there are actually any passengers on the plane. Um, and then shut down the engines. I always plan for these streams to only last an hour, but they always seem to last two hours. It doesn't matter how long the flight is. The stream will be two hours. Almost without fail. Oh, look at that. We're going to have a... We get to have a... Uh, oh, I forgot what it's called now. A jetway. We get to have a jetway. Okay, so now we've got to watch the little guy with the... Uh, with the light one things. Ground trans auto eight zero four requesting pushback. Oh, he's not there today. Usually there's a guy standing there waving his wands. Okay, we put the parking brake on. Are we in place? Oh we're a little bit short. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> right. I will request... Actually, if I want... Okay, there we go. We will ask for the jetway. There we go. Now the jetway comes over. I still think this is one of the coolest parts about this game. This bloody walkway coming over. I've never seen this happen in real life, by the way. Been in one, obviously, but never seen that happen. Okay, so 
that, that's just to let me know that the engines are still running and yeah. so we're gonna go ahead and turn off the engines turn off the fuel pumps connect to connect to external power on then off 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 and turn off turn off okay we'll turn on the engine bleeds that's off off everything is off parking brake is on okay we'll turn off the external power now and turn off the engine bleeds and then we turn off the batteries there we go the plane is now turned off so thank you very much for joining me i hope you've enjoyed yourself um I, it's been a barrel of fun for me uh even if that landing was another terrible landing um yeah join me next week for another friday flight i hope you enjoyed the presentation if you didn't get a chance to watch it be sure to go back and watch it this week's was on aviation during world war one um see you all soon and stay safe